lot of love. So we'll wait. So we're gonna wait this. The meeting actually starts at six. So we have several people online that we'll let them go ahead and join. But in the meantime, what we can do is even maybe go around the room, yeah. right? And introduce ourselves. Um, you Absolutely. Know, we'll start with Andrew. <laughs> Hi, my name is Andrew. Um, I'm the Director of Innovation and Startups at the Greater Peoria Economic Development Council. I also lead Strategic Program Management at Distillery Labs, our regional innovation hub, um, together with Aaron, uh, Aaron Gigas, and he'll give his introduction there. But we're so pleased to, to have everybody here, and I look forward to learning more about Tarterman. I'm uh, Brandon Dieta. I'm a digital product designer for Enoch Collective. Uh, we're pretty much a custom software solutions that uh, come to us for. Uh, but yeah, and uh, I'm just here because I'm a techie and fan of IoT and things like that. And I'm excited to see conversations that happen around Peoria in that space. So I'm just here to hang out and enjoy. Hi, my name is Luke. Uh, it's my first time at IoT, so I'm really excited. Um, so I just graduated from the University of Illinois in uh, chemical engineering. Uh, I've done a little bit of work with IoT, uh, mostly just working with Shodan and uh, using their API. Hello, my name is Nathan Dominaghini, um, the program director for GBeta Distillery Labs, a brand new program here in Peoria. So I'm just getting started. Um, so. Uh, GBeta is essentially it's a, a startup pre accelerator, a uh, seven week program uh, for startups. We, we select five uh, companies twice a year, uh, run them through that seven week program, and uh, really help them get connected with uh, people in the community that can help them get their feet off the ground. Very good. What's that? Yeah, we got there. Okay. Yes. Um, Malik Bodu, um, this is my first time being here. Um, I worked for Caterpillar for 18 years. I uh, just resigned two weeks ago. Oh wow! Taking up a <laughs> taking up a new job at Baker Hughes and uh, still dealing with a few other companies. So I spent most of my time at Caterpillar working on autonomy and uh, digital technology. So I'm excited to be here and meet with you. I'm Barry Davis. I work for OSF, and uh, one of my projects is to help the Story Lab. So working with Andrew. Uh, and others on Distillery Labs, getting them up and running, and uh, super excited to be a part of uh, the IoT and uh, meeting of minds and uh, helping uh, helping distill ideas and launch companies in Korea. Great. And then, uh, hi guys, we can see there we are. My name is Shannon Dubendak. Um, I actually had a 25 year career at Caterpillar. I uh, started my career in IT um, and had an opportunity to, um, oh, somebody was asking me to come in. Sorry, guys, let me look here. There we go, do my job. Um, they had a 25 year career at Caterpillar, uh, starting in IT, uh, had an opportunity to work as a, in the supply chain um, and in product uh, support, product development. And uh, my last job was uh, actually uh, product development of an IoT type of solution, a telematic solution that uh, captured all the data off of the generators worldwide. I now uh, work for T-Mobile and have an opportunity um, as an industry expert or an industry advisor to work with companies on how to bring IoT into the factories and on the products that go out and work uh, in the wild, so to speak. So. Excited to be here. I do lead the IoT Pura meetup. Um, I'll work with uh, Andrew uh, and have an opportunity to, yeah, talk, you know, learn tech, right, and, and share ideas. So that's us here in the room. Um, do we want to turn it over to you, Fred, if you want to go ahead and introduce and those people online? Everybody online, we'll start with Fred. Sure. So uh, we've got another guest, Phil Lockwood. I'm not sure where, I don't see a, an accompany, it just I see your name, Phil. So. You want to introduce who you are? That'd be great. Sure. My name is Philip Lockwood, and I work for Hanson Professional Services. And in that, my role, I'm serving as the director of the Central Illinois Living Laboratory for Smart Connected Mobility. So obviously, IoT devices pay, will eventually play a great role in how we um, 
work towards uh, developing a, a true working uh, laboratory area for smart and connected mobility initiatives. How long has that initiative been underway? Uh, we actually started putting the shape to this uh, formally through a grant from IDOT, the city of Peoria and Peoria County starting this past March, April timeframe. So a lot of the work that we've done to date really has been a combination of research and also compiling and aggregating a lot of the studies and um, grant applications and other um, programs and plans so that we can hit the ground running, so to speak. So when you say mobility, you're talking about like, like uh, micro mobility, uh, all forms, all but um, so driving, everything. Well, what we, I mean, all forms, and so everything from micro mobility through to ultimately and hopefully mobility as a service. So concepts of um, on-demand transit systems uh, and everything that fits within the, the realm of, of case. So uh, connected intelligent assets, autonomous shared economy and electrics. Excellent. All right, well, very good. Yeah, we'll probably have people joining along the way. I'm not sure, um, but I, I just don't want to lose the, the time. So let me uh, let me start off by one saying it's it's great to be here virtually and for everybody this is recorded so there'll be digital replay so we're we're capturing content even though there's some people that are out and about doing other things they should be here doggone it but uh, anyway uh, it's it's great to be here I was supposed to be in Peoria but the crazy stuff happened and and uh, I didn't make it so uh, enjoy your beer enjoy your pizza and I wish I was there to to partake um, but it's a virtual happy hour so. Cheers, I guess. <laughs> and so what we're here to talk about, and we'll, we'll introduce the rest of the team, but the topic is, you know, it, we're talking about TART a bit, but the broader deal really is what's the impact of low power wide area devices and the hyperscale clouds? Uh, two big changes that are happening in kind of the world of IoT that's really going to allow some of the original dreams of the analysts and the uh, and the predictors of the future to, to maybe come true. I think they're about 10 years late and, and, and James gets none of this grief because he was one of the realists back in the day, but there were some others that uh, that had very mighty dreams. Um, but I think we're, we're in a verge, it's really, really quite interesting. Uh, I wanna introduce the folks that are on the, on the, here with me on the team. So Jim Wirt is a co-founder of uh, and CTO of Tardabit and he's coming to you live from Ottawa, Canada. Hi guys, uh, nice to uh, nice to meet you all. I, uh, uh, I I've lived IoT for a long time now. Uh, I was the uh, the CTO at a, a company called Telit, which is one of the major uh, cellular providers or cellular module providers in in the IoT space uh, before uh, leaving to form uh, Tardabit. So I have a, a long history in the space. Uh, got to live kind of the uh, the engineer's dream. I started there as the uh, the corporate intern and ended up as the CTO. So it was a, a fun journey over 19 years. Uh, now it's uh, on to uh, onto new things and uh, very focused on this kind of low power wide area space that uh, you know I think is, uh, is very exciting and an uh, underserved market. So I look forward to talking with you all tonight. All right, and then I think we're, we have a special guest uh, and you'll see him quoted actually in the slide deck, but James Brem is, uh, is a, pretty renowned consultant in this uh, in this space, been around for a long time. And you're in San Antonio, I guess, tonight, right, James? Or are you I, should, I am, yes. Very good. So we've got you surrounded, Peoria. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, go ahead, James, talk to who, what you're up to. Yeah, I, I run a boutique market research and consulting firm focused on, on IoT. I launched the firm about eight years ago prior to uh, us calling it IoT, right? So, but I've been through the gamut of, of, of all of the things that it is. I'm an animal science pre-vet major from Iowa State, right? And that qualifies me for IoT because now we have connected livestock, connected farming systems. I guess. But, but I actually got my dream job with a company called IVP Incorporated, which is the red meat division of Tyson Foods and did, did the first digital transformation project that I know of um, with them in uh, 1992, I think we launched it. And it took three years for us to pull off. 
uh, gathering carcass information to, for, for buying. I got hooked on tech in, in leading that project. Um, looked at the uh, looked at the calendar and saw that I could cash in my stock options and went running for the, whatever the next thing was. Landed at UUNet, so I learned networking with the folks at UUNet. Uh, spent six years at Gateway, the PC manufacturer, from 750 employees to 30,000. I rode that thing real well. Jumped off when Ted decided he was selling the company uh, to Acer and uh, was a nice soft landing. I was one of the original guys at Rackspace. So I've got a background uh, in, in tech, but uh, did a startup after Rackspace that didn't fare so well, was playing golf, trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And Frost and Sullivan called me and said, hey, would you like to come be an analyst and consultant for our team? And I spent 10 years doing that, leading their mobility practice. So we work with companies like Tellet. Um, I, I think I, I met Jim and, and, and Fred about a decade ago and, and did some work for, for them when they were with ILS, which uh, Tellet acquired. Um, uh, we work closely with several of the carriers, at t and T-Mobile um, specifically. So Shannon, I, good awesome. to meet you because uh, we do a lot of the stuff for, for the T-Mobile IoT organization, um, uh, T-Mobile for Business. Okay. Um, and, and, um, and we work with a lot of different startups and things like that. So, um, uh, I'm, I'm one of the founders of Geekdom, which is a tech incubator. I'm a tech stars mentor. Um, so I've played with uh, in, in your realm as well. Right. So I'm, I'm glad that Fred invited me. So glad to have you. Great. Um, Kim, you're the last one on the page here. Uh, you snuck in as we were doing the introductions. I'm not sure who you are. Why don't you tell us? Yeah, so my name's Kim Weinzerl. I am a Caterpillar refugee. I uh, left Caterpillar, um, went and worked at a regional insurance company, Pekin Insurance, for about four years, and I'm currently chief data officer for the state of Tennessee. And I will tell you that state of Tennessee and most states are ages away from IOT, um, but bombshell, I'm taking a new job with a company called Radio Systems Corporation. Um, you might know them as Pet Safe Invisible Fence, um, and they own, I don't know, a lot of dog and cat supply type uh, manufacturing uh, companies. So I'm just here to, to listen and see if that's something that's applicable for animals, and if it works for cattle, I think it works for dogs. <laughs> it depends if you want to lose them or not. Yeah, well, maybe you can even plan that. <laughs> if you, you want know, to lose them, IoT is not good. Honest to God, the favorite conference that I've ever been to in IoT was I, I went and spoke at a conference called Pet Expo about two and a half years ago. <laughs> and, and it had every pet item that was imaginable there. So it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, let's uh, let's get down to business. We're, 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 what we have planned is we've got about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes of sort of presentation. I'll lead us through most of that. We'll flip it over to Jim Wirt. He'll kind of give you a demo to show you how it works and what we do and, and why it's a power tool for guys that are doing innovation. And the reason I say that is we're, we're doing the hard plumbing. Um, it, it's good to be kind of very humble in the fact that what we do is not the answer. It's a really important piece. You shouldn't waste your time trying to do it. Uh, we're working in cooperation with folks like Microsoft that we can get scale and a kind of a, a homogeneous layer so that time can be spent on applications where real customer value can be had. So we, uh, we designed something that was exactly in kind of the white space in the industry. We knew the industry well, as Jim said, we've been in it forever, um, you know, 20 years basically before it was you know, IoT, before it was M to M. When I started, it was kind of like remote SCADA. Uh, they weren't even sure what to call it. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna flip over and share my screen. Uh, Shannon, you let me know when when it works or doesn't work. Hopefully, it's good here. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. coming. All right. Okay. You're on. And you have you it's see the, three. you see slide one, right? Yes, yeah, slide one. Excellent. So this is about as fancy and creative as I got with the title slide. Pretty much everything else is uh, out of our stock deck. But let me let me begin, you know, by talking about our vision. So uh, LP Wayne, we talked about is emerging. Uh, I wouldn't say it's emerging. It's, it's emerging in the market. It's been around. The standard's been around for a little bit uh, in some different implementations. 
but becoming very, very pervasive. And we want it to be very simply the easiest to use, easiest to buy, and easiest to, to deploy LP WAN gateway into the hyperscale clouds. And we'll talk about these, uh, these hyperscale clouds like Microsoft Azure, like AWS, like Google Cloud Platform. They all have their substantial value and they have their Achilles heel, which today is, is sort of the stuff we're doing. Um, we, we introduced ourselves, myself and Jim, we, we had the uh, similar career path in the last uh, 10, 12 years. Uh, ILS technology, which was acquired by Telet. Uh, I was the president and CEO of the, uh, of the Telet uh, uh, IoT platforms and services element. And Jim was the CTO and then rose to be the corporate CTO as well, as he said. So it's great to be here. Um, it's interesting when we think of uh, you know, kind of harnessing LP, WA, wide, you know, light, low power, wide area, and hyperscale cloud advantages. What's the deal here? So it is exploding, and we're going to show you some data, some market data. Um, it's, it's interesting that these uh, LP, WA st uh, technologies and standards, they're really driving down data costs, which uh, sounds great if you're uh, an innovator. It maybe doesn't sound great if you're sitting in T-Mobile shoes because the data plans are going down really quickly, but that's okay. You know, with billions and billions search, just like McDonald's French fries. Um, the, uh, and, and the implementations everywhere, just everywhere, uh, all kinds of imaginable and unimaginable uh, use cases. The advantages that the sensor in the, in the edge technologies and low power wide area are, are bringing in combination with the you know, the radical availability and the, the hyperscale uh, size and, and, and function of these clouds is something that really is driving innovation. It's so quick and easy to, uh, to pin up applications, to start doing work, to, to try to be innovative in this space. Um, and then what do we do? We're the glue between that LPWA side of the problem and our opportunity in the, in the hyperscale folks. So if, if this is sort of the thesis and you say it, it's really blowing up, it's gonna be big, you know, tell me more. Uh, and, and where do we play? These are all the direct connected devices in the world. These are things like cows, like kittens, like dogs, like meters, like assets, like your Amazon Prime box that might have a value of more than $400 in it. Maybe that'll be tracked, not just with your ring camera, but maybe where it is along the way as we go. So, uh, uh, agriculture, uh, anything that's battery powered. Uh, you know, Caterpillar has, you know, big, big devices on your, your gen sets and your vehicles and all that stuff. Those are pretty heavy edge devices, but maybe you put slap and track asset trackers and location trackers on implements, on the shovels, the drills, the bits, the things that are at the end of the arm of, of these beastly uh, machines. Um, and you want them to last for maybe, you know, three, five, seven, 10 years. You can't be draining the battery through, you know, you know, uh, you know unneeded uh, transactions. Uh, infrastructure, you know, smart cities, smart lighting, smart metering, smart connected assets. Uh, we're doing work in areas, you know, we, we were really lucky. You know, Telet had 5,000 customers, everything from connected trash cans to connected uh, uh 140, 50, 60 million dollar semiconductor tools. So from a trash can to a semiconductor tool, that was pretty much our spectrum uh, endpoints in terms of things we connected to. So we saw it all. Um, asset tracking and, and uh, cargo is another huge opportunity for these asset tracker tags that are for the most part low power wide area. Um, where is it Where is it deployed, right? So everybody wants to know where is this stuff deployed? Well pretty much everywhere you need it deployed. And this chart is actually a little bit out of date. It's, it's probably even better than that. I know India is doing some stuff. There's, there's all this, the right stuff that you need in all the places really where you're moving pieces and parts and assets and cars and, and the like. Not a lot going on in middle Africa. Mostly that's still two and 3G still. It's, it's kind of legacy uh, deployments, but uh, it's coming. And like I said, reduced data cost, increased battery life, be able to sweep what we're doing. We're trying to sweep in and, and do some cool stuff with some legacy devices to make some of these old things that were deployed back when, uh, well, heck, I guess back when when James was working at Rackspace or VMware, wherever the heck he was back in the good old days. These are these are non like hyperscale cloud implementations. Maybe they're data centers in the guy's garage or their closet. 
where application servers are running and we need to upgrade those solutions today. It's real. I mean, some some old, old, old IoT solutions are out there with, you know, being held together with duct tape and, and bailing wire. Um, and if you can do the first three, you're probably going to get a better business case. Now, this is why Jim and I started this in uh, July of 2020. Uh, this this kind of orange-ish curve shows the growth rate of the direct connected LP WAN licensed devices. This doesn't even address the unlicensed spectrum of things like Sigfox and LoRa, uh, you know, LoRa, LoRa WAN technologies. This is just a, a picture of sort of the licensing uh, side of this business or the, you know, the, the licensed spectrum. So we're right at the cusp of the crossover point. And I think there, there might have been a three to six or 12 month delay, you know, given COVID uh, in, in deployments, but development continued during that, uh, during that time frame. So a lot of solutions were created and they're in sort of hyper deployment mode right now. Uh, here's some, some specific data around uh, some of these, uh, these advantages. Now, most of you that are in the business, you'll think of MQTT as sort of the, the, the savior, right? Everything was MQTT. It's all great. It works. It's easy. It's pervasive. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of a heavy protocol still for the kind of devices we're talking about. So when, when the, uh, when the, when the licensed uh, spectrum and technology groups like GSMA or 3GPP created the new standard, which was, I think, what, released 12, 13 and 14, about four or five years ago, and kind of the low power wide area NBIOT modules and technology started coming out, a purpose-built uh, protocol was created for those things. And that was this lightweight m to m and you can see here, it's going to save, on average, probably about 72% of your data costs or, or data transfer. The pricing may not be linear, but it's going to save a lot of, a lot of data. It's going to uh, increase the, uh, the lifetime of your battery because you're sending less data. There's less, uh, less uh, just less consumption. The problem is, you know, MQTT is easier. It's kind of designed as being more of a standard. And uh, people have to change their behavior. So what are we doing? We're trying to basically fill this box in here to make much, much easier than MQTT or equal. And it'll bring a lot more of this long-term flexibility and, and upgradability. Um, now, so it sounds great. These low power devices, right? These uh, LTE M and Cat1 and narrowband IoT devices, and where we want to go in the hyperscale clouds, but there are some problems in between. These protocols don't talk to each other at all. Um, if it was up to Microsoft, everybody would have a, a blue TCP IP, you know, Ethernet cable sticked in right into the cloud. It would be a per persistent IP and they'd be sucking in all kinds of data. The, the stuff on the left is really more kind of like a telecom ish protocol. And the, there's just not as much. Uh, awareness, not, a, not as much relevance inside the organization. So that's kind of the, the problem statement. Now, they had an answer for MQTT. When we look in these, um, these goofy things, if you don't know, like Cat M, Cat 1, Cat 3, Cat 12, this is just the type of standards and in, uh, in wireless specifications and types of transactions you can make on a licensed wireless uh, network to go faster and faster and faster, right? In terms of data plan. So your your uh, your your iPhones are on the right, and your dog trackers are on the left of this spectrum, right? What what the hyperscale cloud guys did, and they're all guilty. So AWS, Microsoft, as well as Google, they look at the big pipes, the big fast pipes, and they said, "We're going to give you an SDK that guess what." for the most part, speaks a well-formed MQTT uh, transaction that they love to consume, right? They, they, you know, if you're gonna play with Microsoft and these guys, they're gonna give you exactly what you need. The problem is it's gonna cost you 72% more data, it's gonna drain your battery faster, but they view that as maybe a implementation problem, not a cloud problem, right? What we do is we take everything from really this CAD-M, you know, CAT1, CAD-M down, 
where all these unique protocols are created to really optimize IoT performance from a, again, life cycle battery data, data transactions. And we're this transparent bridge, arrows make it go left to right, but it's really bi-directional. And we'll talk to you a little bit more about that. But this is sort of what we do on a page. And, and it talks about the standards and, and some of the protocols and everything else. So it's about the right tool for the right job, right? If, uh, if your only tool in the box is a hammer, guess what? Every problem looks like a nail. The problem is, you know, those, that spectrum between a $60 million lithography tool for semiconductor manufacturing versus a, a trash can or a pallet tracker are, are very different problems to solve. So this is kind of where we sit. Uh, at the end of the day, we're all about seamless data delivery, trying to make it simple. And, you know, it goes well beyond just lightweight M10. So we look at three different stacks of, of uh, or pillars of integration. The big companies like uh, Telet or Quoctel and Nordic, they have their own clients, they have their methods. So we, we went across and we figured out how to sweep all those guys up. Uh, there's these do-it-yourself uh, solutions that are taking a standard protocol like, like UDP or TCP and they're, they're creating their own data models and structures on there. So we, 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 can, we can manage the, the integration with the right tool set that we bring with IoT uh, Bridge. And then the, uh, the big standards like Lightweight M10 1.0, they evolve as all standards do. And in, uh, in Barcelona, when we were over at Mobile World Congress, we announced support of Lightweight M10 M1.1 with, with one of the standards bodies that does that, which is called uh, OMA. Again, more stuff than you need to know, but this is all the fragmented kind of hard stuff that Microsoft doesn't want to deal with. They like big stable pipes, mass deployments, bring it all in. If everything is you know, formed to be exactly the same match, you know, it's great. We're, we're looking at this as sort of the universal adapter when you're traveling around the world and you got to plug into any outlet, right? That's kind of our, our game. And part of our making it easy to buy, it's available right on Microsoft Azure. It comes right on your Azure bill. Uh, Microsoft does our billing and collections on our behalf. Uh, we don't have to be a uh, certified vendor or a, on the AVL list of a company because it's already using the Microsoft terms and it comes on the Microsoft bill. So, you know, easy to buy, easy to deploy, easy for developers to really engage and, and understand what we're doing. Um, that's kind of it. And hey, here's why James is here. You can read this yourself, James, you, or we can read it for you. But James has followed this space for a long time and he, he understood exactly some of the opportunities that we had and the challenges that these hyperscale folks had, which ultimately created the problem for the developers. So he's uh, tuned in and gets a big shout out from us. We've, we've worked together for a long time and we've always valued his, his points of view as does folks like AT&T and T-Mobile as well. So don't, don't, don't listen to me, listen to the guys that spend real money in this marketplace, billions of deployment uh, capital. So I want to stop there. We can take some Q&A if you want, but I think the best thing to do is really to jump in and let Jim kind of drive and show you uh, how this works and what we do and why we do it. If you're not a techie, it's going to hurt a little bit, but trust me, you'll, you'll survive. You'll, you'll make it through. <laughs> Again, it's a developer's tool. That's really what we're trying to do. And I stopped sharing. So you should okay. Yeah. So I'm going to keep this short and sweet because, uh, you know, I don't think it's, uh, it's not about the details. It's about a little bit of a introduction for everybody about the, uh, the types of things and, you know, what, what we've seen and, you know, I'm going to kind of start at the end and work my, you know, work my way backwards. Um, you know, getting data into these high value systems in an easy way, is really where the challenge is. I mean, it's great when you say, okay, I can go grab a couple of developers. I can go, you know, put together these pieces. Hey, I got a, a proof of concept working, but, you know, doing things at production scale, being able to roll it out, you know, th this takes effort. Um, and, you know, this is where uh, we've, why we partnered with Microsoft because they have kind of, let's say the tools over the top that people know how to use. 
we just got to help try to try to make that uh, IoT integration a, a little bit easier in between. So, you know, whether it's something like, uh, you know, looking at, in this case, it, it's a smart home use case. Okay, you know, we can, uh, we can look at, uh, you know, environmental data from around, uh, you know, from around the home. We can look at, uh, you know, we can look at asset trackers. So these are uh, LTE, CAD-M uh, uh, asset trackers that are using a, uh, this happens to all be going through uh, uh, Microsoft's uh, Azure IoT Central, which is their kind of uh, managed IoT platform. So we can see a bunch of my tracking devices uh, sitting up here in Canada, uh, outside of Ottawa. Uh, and you know, you you say, okay, you know, this is the this isn't bad. Okay, I you know, I get what you're what you're doing, but the the key is is the, what you're actually looking at here, each of those dots happens to be a different vendor's device that, you know, is seamlessly made to, to kind of sit side by side and, uh, you know, and, and uh, show us where it is and where it's been. Uh, and, you know, you come up with, and, you know, companies come up with all the innovative use cases. Oh, you know, where, where's my pet? Where's my cow? Where's my, uh, where's my uh, mother-in-law? Uh, you know, there, there's all sorts of things you can track. Um, I, uh, I, I may or may not have one of these in my uh, four-year-old's backpack that he uh, wears to school. Um, you know, the, the, uh, but, you know, the, the key is when you look at how we grab the data, uh, first of all, you know, if I, so, you know, we, we look then and say something like our platform, these are devices. So, so we're looking here now at devices from a company called QuakeLink. Uh, so, you know, from our perspective, we realize these in an easy way. Everything's bundled through templates. You know, again, the, trying to make IoT easy is actually the hard part. Uh, you know, trying to make it so people can say, okay, I want to go and uh, grab a, a uh, in this case, a, a uh, you know, a nice finished asset tracker and uh, feed the data into a application. Maybe I just wanted to send webhook data to my own application. You know, there's a lot of smart developers out there. They'll figure out what they uh, what they want to do with it. So, what do you need? Oh, okay. We need we need the ID of the device, and we need where you want to send the data. And uh, once imported, the uh, the information will flow. And th this has proven to be very easy for people to figure out. And we we did all of our configuration in a very low code way. So, if I look at uh, a a example here you can see basically the, the low code part of our platform. So, okay, I'm triggering when a, uh, when a quick link report comes in. Uh, so we have a lot of different events we can use. Um, and then, uh, you know, when that happens, uh, we basically then use our decoders to be able to go and massage that data, get it into the format we want for going to IoT Central and then push the data on. To give you an idea of the types of uh, events that come from these devices. So uh, here, okay, we're looking at a uh, uh, OBD2 tracker. So this one is a uh, something that plugs into the diagnostic port on your car. So we can see as this device reports in, okay, we're, we're in ignition off, uh, the ignition's off, the device isn't moving, here's its current location. Uh, data from the OBD port, so I, I get the VIN of the vehicle, the RPMs, fuel level. Uh, you know, the, these will, uh, of course, uh, light up when the the, the vehicle starts moving. Um, but you know, this is the type of thing that that tries to make it so easy. It, it's it's not that the device is magically sending us these uh, nice formatted documents. The device is sending us uh, uh, crazy optimized. Uh, kind of packed UDP messages that we go and expand into something that's easy for customers to consume. And then how you pull this data out to reformat and, and use in your own application, uh, you know, is where the, uh, where the magic is. Um, so here we see, uh, okay, so there's a different type of device. So here's just a, uh, an asset tracker. So we look at this and again, different, different device, uh, and this one is, uh, okay, this is a, a movement report from a, uh, a normal battery powered asset trackers. You know, so there's 
no OBD2. It we get a few different pieces of data. We now get we get a battery level. We get, uh, but we still get the same location and, and other information. So, uh, you know, we try to make this as kind of straightforward as possible to uh, to put the pieces together. Uh, but this is this is where uh, where things always get interesting with these types of applications because everybody wants to do something a little different. So, you know, when when people say, "Well, I just want the uh, the easy button. I just want to go and have my my data show up in a, a you know a pretty dashboard. You know that that's great. That's kind of uh, IoT for beginners. Now it's how can I take this data and feed a digital twin based architecture? How can I feed a machine learning or an analytic system? And and this is where platforms like ours come in to help kind of do that multiplexing and send the data onto different systems and uh, you know make it uh, make it very easy for people. Uh, if I switch and look at say something like lightweight M to M, um, again, you know, it's a, this is a, a different type of protocol, different type of devices. So customers come in and manage your devices. They manage all the security keys through our platform. So everything's uh, kind of e easy to manage and integrated. And then again, all the workflows are all uh, kind of easily managed for what do I do when different types of, of uh, events happen? So oh, I want to make a buzzer sound. I want to, I need to send an alarm. I want to know what to do when a location comes in or a geofence gets crossed. Yeah. Uh, and again, we try to make it easy by, uh, by bringing in as much uh, debugging information as we can. I ate the cookie. Great that you ate the cookie. Yeah. Oh, you didn't eat your pizza, but you ate the cookie? Yeah. Smart guy. Boy, you know, what about the apple? Did you eat the apple? No. Oh, okay. So, uh, so, so that's, that's a, a bunch of stuff, right? I mean, for some of you in the room, you're like, well, that's a bunch of stuff. Uh, one of the things, are, are you done showing details, Jim? Yeah. I wanted to just flip to, a, uh, to one, one success story. Because you might say, well, who cares? You know, I, I didn't understand it. That's interesting. This is a success story that Jim showed you a QuackLink device into Azure doing, doing some cool stuff. One of your startups up in the greater Chicagoland area basically uh, put together this, this uh, success story in uh, cooperation with Microsoft. And if you're sitting out there trying to become a startup, trying to be an innovator or, or surviving in a in an incubator environment, like, like many of you are, um, if you could save 12 months and take, you know, a few minutes to do something with a really cool tool, uh, if anybody's in construction or building or fixing anything, you know that, you know, you're not paying that mechanic because he's, uh, he's so, uh, you know, skilled at everything. These guys have the right tools. They have the right lifts. They have the right stuff. So the fact is, you know, we are we are coming here trying to take months off of development cycles so that people can really innovate where where the, the real stuff needs to happen, which is applications that deliver value to the enterprise, value to the business, value to a PL, value to public safety, value to uh, you know public health. These are all the things that people care about, not so much how the plumbing is connected. Uh, when you know, when my wife goes and picks up you know, I bring the car back from the garage after she's fixed it. She doesn't care how they did the brake, the brakes. They didn't care how to lift or if he jacked it up four times on each corner. She just wants the brakes fixed. So we're all about solving the problem quick that developers sometimes get stuck in the weeds with. And, and kind of that's that's sort of the end of the game. So um, if you're in the IoT business and you're going to be modern, and you're going to use hyperscale clouds and you're going to use the new family of devices, we're a pretty darn good tool to uh, to play with, and we'll leave it at that. We'll take Q and A or thoughts. I don't know if anybody else has tried to join Shannon, but um, did one of the person join? I don't know if anybody did. I, I yeah, we did. We had something. One. But, but but again, it's uh, recorded, and we'll we'll be able to play back. But some great questions or some thoughts would be fantastic. Fred, I'm going to jump in and, and say one quick thing to, to, to reinforce what Jim said. One of the things that he said, I, th I think it's a big thing on there, is, is um, 
the carriers speak carrier language, the enterprises speak an enterprise language, and the hyperscalers speak their language. And all those things are, are different. And you're never going to make IoT easy because IoT by itself isn't a thing. It's a whole bunch of different things on connecting these devices. You can take that OBD2 device. I've got one here that you guys were talking about and do so many different things. It can be um, used for HR purposes and understanding when the vehicle or when the driver of the vehicle actually uh, started at work or when, when, when it's in service for insurance, for lot management, for planning, for quality of the vehicle, for engine um, uh uh, is it out of gas? Things like that. But you can never make IoT easy. What this is doing, what, what Tardabit is doing, is hiding that complexity. And that's the only thing that we're going to do here, is be able to hide the complexity and, and make it easier for, for people. Because you don't make it. it, it it's inherently never going to be easy. So. Yeah, it's, it's the most heterogeneous three-letter acronym you could make up, I think. Yeah, I was, I was on a, I was actually on a, on a call with Cisco today with 124 other analysts and somebody from Cisco said, hey, we got to make this as easy as enterprise Wi-Fi. And I said, it ain't ever going to happen because enterprise Wi-Fi is like one or two use cases, right? This is how many? It's the, the sky's the limit. Well, so I'm, I'm curious. Um, with if you guys have ran into any use cases, you know, um, on, on smart cities and maybe fr from the perspective of transportation, talk about infrastructure. Do you guys have a, a use case that you've done with smart kit cities and infrastructure? Well, smart cities is almost as complex as saying IoT because it's, it's an incredible ecosystem of point solutions. You have trash, trash management, lighting, lighting management, transportation, micro transport, you know, micro transportation. There's all these things. And what's interesting about a smart city is how you tie all these data sources when it needs to be interoperable and shared and managed jointly. How do you do that? Uh, you know, and a great example of that is a, an emergency vehicle going through. How do you change the lights? How do you, right? And so you've got one thing that's in a vehicle and to vehicle location, then you got another thing which is like road and, and traffic lights. So that's a great example of how you do it. Uh, another thing that's interesting is when you're dealing with like crowd control, a big, a big deal, unfortunately, 20 years ago was kind of post 9-11 and I was engaged with a project at a, uh, at a, at a big theme park, a Florida big theme park. Um, and it was all about um, evacuations and, and understanding flow and heat maps of people. Uh, you know, a big theme park is kind of like a big city, right? There's and on boards and signs and there's directional things and there's how do you do passes to get on a ride and how do you manage trash and money? And so, you know, it's really big. So the bottom line is there's a lot of devices in a city that report directly into these big clouds, right? They're, they're not they're not big servers sitting there controlling these, uh, these garbage cans. These garbage cans are all connected directly. So there are many, many things we connect to in a smart city. We leave it up to the folks like Microsoft in their hyperscale cloud. This is the value of the hyperscale cloud. They can share that data up top and do all kinds of stuff. But in the old days, the olden days, you know, the trash can application was a standalone stove pipe app. And the lighting was a standalone stove pipe back. And the telematics was a standalone stove pipe back. And the, you know, the elevator monitoring system was a standalone. If they're all kind of starting to show up into a, a Microsoft Azure space and the city is, is maybe an Azure or a Microsoft customer, they can really start doing some very cool and powerful things. So, you know, where we play, Shannon, yeah, we can deal with lots of smart city stuff. But where the magic of a smart city starts to happen is when cities start architecting, I think, more at the, at the cloud and the interoperability of data level, which is kind of above us in the stack. We, make, we give them 12 months extra time to go figure that stuff out up top. Is, is there a um, limit on the amount of data that comes through? I mean, you said it's a low power land, so is that it's just a little bit of data or is there a size of data that can come up in these two packets or? Uh, did Jim, you fall off, Jim? Jim fell off. Um, so 
video, right? It wouldn't do something like a video. It would do just a little no, bit. No, video is going to be like that cat four or higher kind of a connection for the most part. Now, these are going to be, uh, you know, spotty, squirty kind of data. Uh, now, you, you can push a lot of data, but you're, you're really designing this thing to be like properties. You know, what's the temperature? What's the location? What's the GPS? You know, in the lightweight M to M spec, they call them objects. So, you know, you're looking at objects. Is the gas full or empty? Is the, what is the location lat long? What is the, uh, is the, is the trash can, you know, full of garbage because there's a, 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 a you know, a sensor on the top that's, that's measuring the, uh, the depth, uh, you know, like a, like a, uh, uh, ultrasonic sensor that's measuring how full a can is. We're not looking for streaming streaming uh, kind of services through this type of stuff. I have a question. Uh, this is um, you said that it solves the data issue. I'm just curious, uh, is it a compression or how do you solve the 72% data? Well, there are, there are devices that are supposed to talk a little and when you try to use, for example, these, these MQTT protocols and clients, you're, you're shoving a little data through a really big structure. Uh, just it's a more complex protocol. It's just a lot more overhead. Okay. Um, so it's, it's really not that we're compressing or doing anything unique. We're taking the source data and sending it in the most optimized way. I mean, it's really easy for you to probably walk across the street to go to work. But if you wanted to take the train, you know, you've got to get on a train. You take it to the stop on one side of the city to so you can turn around and get off on the other side of the station. We just let you walk across the street in exactly the way it's supposed to be done. Okay. A really bad analogy, but we keep it simple. I have a question about your two-way arrow chart you had. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say, for example, you have a pet in a perimeter. <laughs> if they were to breach that perimeter, like you could send signal back or a uh, tone or a shock or whatever. So it's, an, it's a sense and a respond, right? So IoT is usually sensing something, doing some processing, creating some alarm or event or, or an alert, and then sending that information and triggering some type of an action. So, you know, a control loop in IoT isn't really real time, but it's pretty close. I say, yeah. for all practical purposes, good enough for, for certain use cases. So yeah, you can set a, like a geofence. You can draw a perimeter around your yard or around your city. And if you leave the, uh, the geofence, you can sense that in the cloud, or you can even do it sometimes at the edge in the device if it's, if it's enabled, and then you can create an action to do uh, you know, send yourself a, an SMS in your phone or you know, turn on a uh, vibration on the dog collar maybe to, to warn your dog that, hey, you better come back or else something's going to really happen in a minute that you don't like. Yeah. So, yeah, those, those kind of things are, are all doable with IoT. Okay. Awesome. In these kind of devices. Like I said, this, this allows you to go upstream and downstream if the protocol allows uh, both, you know, both bidirectional, we support bidirectional. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask another question? What is the largest uh, scale of uh, deployment so far? Um, in, the, in the IoT world, in this kind of stuff, I would say some of the largest scales are going to be in things like meter reading, water meters, utilities, and transportation. That's where most of the big scale has happened. The guy on the phone that can answer that in far more detail with more accuracy is James. Yeah, metering is metering is it, especially uh, uh, looking at low power white area stuff. Uh, if you look at China just by itself, um, they have deployed over a billion smart meters over there, utilizing narrowband IoT. So, what, what I meant was specific with the Tardabit bridge. Uh, many, many, many. We're, we're engaged with some metering companies right now doing a project that's not exactly public right now, but uh, you'll, it's measured in the millions. Okay, thanks. 
I have a question in regard uh, to applications in senior care, which is going to be just a, a continue to be a booming area, um, but primarily in terms of Alzheimer's and dementia, where there's a huge lack of innovation there, um, and certainly no cure for it as well. So the best cure we have for it is treatment and care. Um, so where do you, what do you guys view in terms of its applications in senior care, not just now, but more so next five years? Well, it's, that's uh, it, it, it tell it. We actually had a few, um, a few customers in this space, so they're there. Uh, a couple of things are uh, just tracking the person, right? When mom walks to the grocery store and then she continues to walk home in the same vector, uh, you can geofence typical paths that maybe a dementia patient takes if they're still, you know, trying to trying to stay at home alone or whatever. Um, there's there's all kinds of assistance you can take. Uh, we're also doing stuff and things, you know, and, and not as not in, a, in an illness, but like loan worker, upstream oil, upstream exploration, um, you know, snowmobiles that are up in the in the in the Yukon, and if somebody separates from their snowmobile, you now have two different special you know, GPS locations, and maybe puts a man down. So there's there's those kinds of tracking the the, the dementia patient. Um, there's also some really cool things happening in the home, pressure mats, sensor mats, motion detectors. Did they get out of bed? Did they take their medicine? There's dispensers now that are IOT enabled dispensers for medicine. There's, there's intelligent refrigerators. There's pressure bath mats. I mean, the world is actually, uh, the technology is capable of solving most of the world's problems today. It's, it's kind of scary when you think through the optics of technology. It really comes down to, is there a business case for that? Can you really make money doing it? And where I think we help is we, we drop that data plan 75%. And, and a lot of this is also Wi-Fi connected devices, right? It's not all licensed, you know, cellular. Uh, in a home, it can be Wi-Fi, Zigbee, you know, there's the PAN networks. There's all kinds of technologies to, to really help the, uh, the solution that, you know, the, the problem set that you just defined. When um, I'm, I'm glad somebody brought up Alzheimer's because that's uh, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. My mom, my mother is actually the former chairperson of the Alzheimer's Association. And in 2007, I worked with the Alzheimer's Association. Um, a, I can't say the name of the hardware company um, that we worked with, um, but it was also with Sprint Nextel at the time on developing a solution. The problem wasn't the technology. And it, and it still isn't the technology. The problem's the business model out there. Um, we created some, some tracking devices. Um, and what the Alzheimer's Association did at that time with them uh, was they sold them at the value that they felt um, people got from them, which was probably too high, $45 a month. Um, uh, and, and there were different levels of geofencing in there. Uh, and you could set it, set up your own, you know, perimeters uh, within these things. It was it was fairly complex to do those types of things, setting up the perimeters. Then, now let's fast forward over a decade. That stuff's pretty pretty straightforward. It's 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 drag and drop and click uh, to be able to set that up. It's a matter of how do you get these things in the hands of the people that need them, and it's also a matter of how do you get adherence around the people that actually need to use them as well. Most people that need a tracking device because they have dementia don't like it because they think they're being tracked or it's ugly or right. So we got, we have to figure out other ways around. And, and that's like business model problems. That's do we put it inside the shoe? Um, is it a piece of jewelry? Right. And they're, and they're okay with that. So uh, we have to get to that point now. So I'd love to elaborate on that with you guys in the future if you want to. Um, you know, I think I think one of the one of the other glaring issues in the senior healthcare field, really healthcare in general, is uh, we're going to be running into staffing shortages, and that's you know that's an issue now. It's been an issue ten years ago, and it's going to be an even larger issue in the future. Um, I can certainly see the applications here: reduce labor costs, not just for families, but for the individual themselves, um, and allow families themselves to go to work and still ensure safety back home. 
it was very interesting. I was in uh, Barcelona for Mobile World Congress this uh, last couple of days in June, first couple of days in July. It was really the first, kind of the first opening of a, of a 45 country international trade show. So there were still a lot of no-shows. There were still a lot of, you know, attempts at social distancing. And in one of the booths, uh, Telco DR's booth, they actually had the, like the classroom robots, right? That had a, a bot with a, a tablet on it that you could run around and, and you could do guided tours in the booth, even though the gentleman might be in Shanghai, right? You see his picture on the face of the robot and he's going around and he's seeing everything. You know, you think about a, a family that works and they want to keep an eye on, on, a, on a parent. Um, you can be active like that kind of monitoring, or it can be very passive with all the other embedded sensors. And it really, I think James hit it right. It's, it's really kind of what is the right solution for the patient. If the patient thinks that that little robot running around is pretty cool, guess what? That's going to work. If they think that that little robot sucks, yeah. that solution will not work. You know, they need the embedded sensor in the shoe and they don't know it's there. Um, so yeah, there's, it's, and I'll tell you, for guys like you, you know, running innovation parks, uh, smart cities, you're, you're, you're the guys, you're the, you're the folks that are going to solve some of these problems because you're going to look at it through a different optic. And you're going to have tools available to you that James didn't have a decade ago when he was working with, you know, the undisclosed company. It's just possible now. And it's about, I think, creativity because the tools and the technologies are for the most part now coming of age. So I'm curious, this is a little bit different topic going to maybe more of a, um, I'm trying to slip, answer the question. Um, more of a question that relates to, uh, it could be mining, it could be um, uh, construction, but in a very, very remote location, and the only thing that you have available is a uh, satellite. Does this, because of the amount of compression, you said like, well, because you're going directly into uh, uh, Microsoft Azure, um, would this help in a satellite uh, use case where we could really reduce the amount of data going? 100%. Matter of fact, we have three different satellite programs going on right now at Target, which is very cool. Um, that might be news to you, James. I saw a little eyebrow there. Uh, <laughs> there, uh, there, but yes, it is. It is a very constrained uh, technology in terms of throughput and data. Um, and some go up and down to a base station. There's a new company that's in Spain called Sat IoT. Sat IoT has actually got a uh, nano uh, cube, you know, cube. Cube, uh, nanocube site satellites that are uh, NV IoT antennas. Oh, wow. And, they, and they've got a bird in the ground. They got a bird around uh, in orbit right now. Um, it's, it's very, very cool. And it's, I think it's uh, release 19 of the spec that allows the new radios to be able to communicate to that. And now you're talking about things like uh, polar uh, ice monitoring. You know, Amazon rainforest, uh, you know, assets and in, in, in wildlife and migrating, uh, migrating wildlife when you start getting these constellations of these nanosats up there. You know, that's the promise. Uh, you know, lots of things are promised and it takes a long time to implement, you know, commercially. But uh, from a technology point of view, we're starting to see that this is possible. Great. I know that there's a lot of money spent on satellite charges at uh, the Yellow Company. So. Nearby. Really, so we're kind of in the area, in the zip code. <laughs> <laughs> so we're close to the area. Yeah. So uh, personal safety, police, uh, first responders. Think about what's changed there. Uh, body armor, uh, intelligent body cameras, evidentiary proof, uh, safety, responsiveness. All these kinds of things are being enabled with IoT. Yeah. I mean, think about the connected soldiers too, right? The idea that the, like you said, the armor, um, the helmet, everything can be uh, measured. So I think that's super interesting. Just think if you could drop a sensor out of the, out of the sky that cost $10, $10 that had shock, vibe, light. 
and a cellular connection. And you could drop a million of them out there. That's only $10 million. That's not a lot when you're talking about military ballistics, missiles, planes. And if you were to just carpet a half mile wide, you know, 10 mile strip with a million sensors that could measure foot traffic because you'd see vibration. It could measure shadows if a vehicle went over because you could see that you would have a, a change in, in light and aperture. And you can have probably a connected soldier standing in the middle of it with his radios because he's obfuscated by a million radios all around him. He's hiding in the wide open. If you put a soldier with a radio in a desert, they hate that because they're the only radio. It's easy to find a radio. But if you're a radio in a million radios, you're, you're missing. So these are kind of things when you think about what is a $10 million budget to put a carpet of sensors in an intelligent instrumented battlefield, you just start solving problems differently. Mm -hmm. It's just shockingly possible. So any other questions in the room or online? So if, if we have somebody who we come across through this IoT group or distillery labs and they're playing in this space, we can connect them with you and learn how to, uh, how to connect and how to deploy their technology through your platform. Another question there too. Um, first of all, we love that. That's great. Um, but I will tell you that um, we are so darn easy. Uh, they can go to the Microsoft Marketplace. They can select this. They get 30 days for free, and that goes into auto billing. Uh, it's billed as a service. It's billed as a microservice, so it's actually not billed per device. Many old IoT solutions had what they called an MRC, or like a dollar per device. That immediately makes things unaffordable sometimes. So now, think of it as all your transactions are pooled. I've got 10,000 garbage cans in the city of Philadelphia. I, I don't want to charge you ten thousand dollars a month for that. Maybe I really have five, eight, a thousand dollars worth of transactions. You know, maybe maybe that's a better business model. So it's very very easy to do. Uh, there's help. There's videos. Uh, um, it's low code. Anybody that's trying to solve this problem has probably got enough technical acumen to really understand the value of the tool. But if you need help, you guys you guys have our contact information. Don't hesitate at all to to reach out to us. Call Shannon. She'll sell it to you through T-Mobile. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> Absolutely. I see that there's a, a question in chat from yeah. Dean. Um, and and I just got done speaking at, at uh, InfoAg, which is one of the largest agriculture IoT conferences out there. And, um, and and it's funny, when I started the conference, it was, it was not really about IoT. And I uh, spoke there two years ago. And the only person that used the word IoT was myself. And this year, um, I, I, I uh, ran two different sessions, two different days there. And I, I took a little little uh, notepad to write down how many times I heard the word IoT. And it turned out to be 154 times the term was used uh, throughout, the, throughout the days. Um, so ag is getting a lot of IoT love today. The question there is, um, if there's no electricity, um, you know, can you can the sensors communicate? Well, at this point in time, the answer is no. However, we're seeing some some unique technologies where um, one of the large um, chemical companies is is got a sensor that actually um, can generate electricity off of a corn plant. Right and and be able to send. Um, now, are we ready for that today? No. Is it probably five years away? Absolutely. Is it two or three? Maybe. Um, I've seen sensors deployed in in rural areas on on things like bridges, where the vibration of the vehicle going across the bridge then charges the sensor that's on the bridge. Right. So there are things that that can be done um, from from an electricity standpoint. Okay. Um, also, he's asking about Wi-Fi. Who cares about Wi-Fi? If I'm an ag, I'm not going to have Wi-Fi in the middle of a field, right? I, I'm not going to have it in the middle of a pasture. It, it's not going to be in the middle of Montana, in, 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 you know, 
in, in the open plains. Um, but satellite, Fred was talking about the, the, the cube satellite stuff. The satellite stuff is available 100% around the world, right? Um, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of cost, right? And, and, and data, from a data transmission standpoint. Um, I questioned a lot of people at InfoAg about uh, the cellular providers and do they have enough cellular connectivity across the Midwest? And, and some of these guys that are doing autonomous uh, uh, farming are saying that Verizon's coverage is pretty darn good right now. Um, uh, that T-Mobile and AT&T need to get their act together a little bit, you know, but, but, but. Uh, I'm going to counter this in just a minute. Okay. I'll let you finish. But, um, but U.S. Cellular also has coverage there and AT&T and T-Mobile, they can roam on, onto those networks. So there's not a problem with, with, with chasing that. It's, it's a matter of densification. And um, I just, I just wrote an article where I asked the question, whose responsibility is this rural broadband stuff anyway, or, or rural connectivity stuff? And, and we actually have to get the government to look at things a little bit differently. And we have to get the, the nation covered. If we look, if we used electrification or telecommunications as the, the, the measure, then it's the government that provides the bond and, and, and the money and it's, it's cooperatives that actually end up doing the development and build out. So we have to figure out who the heck it's going to be us that are going to do the build out. It's not going to be AT&T or T-Mobile. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's another, there's another kind of simple answer, Dean, that is available to you. There's the private band or the, the, the unlicensed spectrum like Laura. Uh, you can put a couple of Laura base stations in a big, big field with you get hundreds of miles of uh, connectivity because you don't need a lot of power, Fred. Still need a lot of power. Yeah, but you got solar. You know, you you, you can you can with solar and battery. I've seen a lot of solar battery deals in the sensors because the question was kind of focused on the sensors. The battery life of some of these sensors can be, you know, 10 years. It can they can be very, very long. They can certainly be within a crop season. Um, but yeah, there, there are ways to do this, but, uh, sorry, I'm going to keep you honest. They're not 10 years. We're saying they're 10 years, but it, <laughs> nothing has lasted 10 years yet. So I'll tell you in seven more, if these, some of these sensors will last 10 years. Well, I said, or a crop season, which is usually <laughs> three to six months, but no, a lot of them are known to last three to five years. A lot of people do say 10, but you got to send like one message every three months. Um, <laughs> so. I just want to add to the, the coverage part of that because I, I do want to speak up for T-Mobile. Um, since they've done the merger with Sprint and they have, uh, they don't just do, when you talk about the 5G coverage, right? It's not just the, the millimeter wave, but it's at mid spectrum. They, there is a lot of uh, spectrum that came in with the acquisition of Sprint. And when that happened, that coverage that's going across, especially in the US and especially in the rural areas is getting extremely um, reliable and it is getting very, very, uh, good coverage across the U.S. There's very few places that don't have coverage. So um, th there will be, I think cell would be the way to go. And then I think you're right, Fred. I mean, from a battery perspective, batteries, there's new innovations all the time that are getting yeah. the batteries to, to last long. Yeah. It depends if you're doing sensors, it doesn't take a lot of yeah. battery, right? Yeah. And then you got solar. And, and when we have NTS innovation. Yes, and NT innovation is doing the harvesting, right? I thought that yeah. was very yeah. so good. So I don't know if you guys know, but this is a startup here called NTS Innovations, and they're harvesting um, graph using graphene at the nano scale to harvest energy and uh, for IoT devices, uh, the equivalent of a, a double or triple A battery cell. And so they've assembled a, a array that is scheduled to be uh, for alpha testing this year, end of this year. Very cool. Yeah, like, you know, like, like, like everybody has kind of violently agreed. Um, the technologies are going fast enough. There's enough out there to do to solve many, many problems. There's corner cases that are, are rougher, but even there, you know, just over the horizon, we're seeing some technologies that can come and solve that. And to the point of it's a government challenge as well. Uh, for example, in Brazil, 
agriculture is one of their largest economic drivers for GDP. And they have done some private public partnerships and folks like uh, Telecom Italia, you know, Tim, Tim Brazil, they have NVIOT coverage in places that you would never imagine, just ever, ever imagine in the most rural places to, to uh, support the, the ag business. So it, it is possible, it's feasible, it's, it's all about the money in the business case. See, that was a great question to ask, Dean. <laughs> do you have another one? <laughs> now, I do want to scare everybody with one thing real quick. Oh, There's 170 million cellularly connected IoT devices in the United States right now. And about 45 million of those are set to go dark over the next year and a half because companies like AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon are reforming their low-end spectrum, their, their 2G, 3G, um, and even some of the 4G spectrum already. So that's, that's where what Fred's doing is, is really interesting because th that stuff is, for the most part, low bandwidth, right? Uh, IoT stuff. And doesn't require massive amounts of bandwidth. We're seeing IoT right now really bifurcate itself. And, and you have the, the body cams and the connected video surveillance and things like that, pushing massive amounts of, of, of data. But the majority of devices are, are really don't need to push very much data and are perfect for um, people to develop solution, you, you know, utilizing Tardibit. Yeah, that was that one line I showed you where the orange curve just started yeah. going crazy. That's, that's, the, that's the bifurcation. Um, I'm not a tech guy. Where does the name Tardibit come from? Is that some play on terms there? That's uh, Jim should have been here for that. It was uh, his family in Ottawa did this. So one, it's very very hard to come up with a name that doesn't that's even pronounceable uh, and doesn't have dashes or commas or you know six vowels and fourteen consonants that you just get a dot com for right. So Tardibit is uh, is got a an Arabic Lebanese uh, element to it around like conversation translation. Oh, cool. Oh, okay. Interesting. That's what I've been told. I, I will. I will claim. Uh, that's what I've been told by the the, the work family. But it worked, and it was available. <laughs> <laughs> the, the real reason is GoDaddy had it. We grabbed it, and it was good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great conversation tonight. Yes. Um, really good and thoughtful questions, and uh, good conversation. It's been just a wonderful IoT meetup. I would like to um, thank. You know, Fred uh, and uh, Jim for coming and, and, and giving this great presentation on Tardivit and educating us on IoT and especially the, the low power WAN. Um, it's been great uh, conversation, James, with uh, talking with you as well from an industry perspective and then just all the conversation online and, and, and across. So I want to thank everybody for, for coming. I want to thank uh, also Fred for the, the pizza and the beers. That was awesome. Um, you'll get the bill later. Yeah. <laughs> Um, just, just for everybody coming tonight and, and um, participating. I see this growing. Um, both Andrew and I are connecting more as part of uh, the Whiskey Talks and the, the innovation and startups within the Peoria area. This is growing, which I think some of you guys know already. Um, and uh, so stay tuned and, and keep coming. So thank you to, to our presenters and thank you to all of you. You and, and I think you guys have uh, something good going. I think there's what like uh, 700 some members in the group, in yes. the meetup group. So you know this does get airplay. The brave guys came out tonight, so thank you and uh, take home the extra pizza and, and enjoy. So uh, best of luck. I, we I enjoyed the time and James, thanks so much for joining us and adding so much value. So uh, you really you really rounded out the discussion tonight. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you. And this will be recorded. I will go ahead and put it out to the meetup group. I'll also put it out there um, on to the, the folks on LinkedIn so that people can, can see the recording if they can be able to join. Or you want to show it again, see it again. So. Very good. Thank you. You guys thank have a good night. You betcha. Bye-bye. We'll see you tomorrow bright and early. You bet. <laughs> Stop the recording. Or just press it. Hmm? Press end and everything will stop.
Yeah, I will. Sometimes it seems like oh, don't on, stop on, on the call. On the call. Yeah. Yeah. Right here. Oh, there you go. 